these restrictions are also relevant to the International Criminal Trials Act, Section 64, 65, and 66, which permits proceedings to continue, notwithstanding the absence of a judge from the trial as well as the substitution of a judge in the event of his indisposition due to death or illness. It is very clear that such arrangements during an ongoing trial may raise genuine issues of a capacity for a judge to be able to try a case fairly in such circumstances. There is even no test or provision for how such a judge who is parachuting into a trial once it has started, halfway through, three quarters of the way through, or before the end, what level of knowledge or work he should have done to be able to understand trial, which he is now part of the decision-making process. It would be at least in the interest of justice for the court during the proceedings to provide a justification to the accused, to the counsel, to the victims, to the prosecution, and most of all, to the public, to provide a justification and be held accountable for any decisions it made under these provisions. The lack of right to challenge and inability to request the tribunal to be accountable for its conduct and the trial can also be seen in Section 10H of the International Criminal Trials Act as amended in 2009, which restricts the rights of parties to object or question a witness questioned by a judge. A party may have good grounds for objection to the conduct or action of a member of the tribunal which may be unfair. For instance, if a question is contrary to the rules of evidence, is unfair, is wrong in fact, irrelevant to the issue, or misleading to the witness, or capable of misinterpretation. I have made many such objections during my career international criminal trial judges during a trial and the judge has had to justify why his question is right or admit why his question is wrong and on many occasions they have followed my guidance in how to properly question the witness. Let us now look one of the cornerstones of justice, the protection from self-incrimination. The International Crimes Tribunals Amendment Act of 2009 is also in conflict with the international principle of protection from self-incrimination, which is linked to the presumption of innocence. This important safeguard is to prevent investigators from forcing information from people detained and questioned by them. Although Section 85 of the Act restricts the effects of such questioning to the provision of information, as all the events now being investigated and to be the subject of trial, are nearly 40 years since the events concerned. 
there can be no justification based upon national emergency to support such a rule. Code of Criminal Procedure 161 Paragraph 2 of your own national laws provides for protection against self-incrimination within the national criminal law of Bangladesh. And this is an example of divergent standards of justice. There is a two-speed system of justice available under your national criminal law. Section 11, subsection 2 of the Act also permits the trial judges to draw an adverse inference during the trial an accused person refuses to answer questions asked of him. This is a further challenge to the rule that protects an accused from being compelled to testify in his trial as found in Article 14.3G of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights. It can also be said to be in conflict with the presumption of innocence in a criminal trial for failure may give rise to an adverse inference and therefore to avoid the adverse inference the accused is required or compelled to answer the question. Let us look now at the burden of proof, another cornerstone of justice. The International Crimes Tribunal Rules of Procedure, passed on the 15th of July 2010, and Rule 50, provides for the burden of proof to be on the prosecution. This was not originally included within the Act in any form. Rule 51, sub-rule 1, however requires the defence to prove alibi if it is relied upon and any particular fact or information which is in the possession or knowledge of the defence. This is in conflict with the presumption of innocence and the burden of proof being upon the prosecution as set out clearly in the International Covenant at Article 14 2 and is a universally recognised principle of law. If an acute raises alibi, the burden should still remain upon the prosecution to prove its case and disprove alibi. This also applies to other facts or information raised by the defence. If the prosecution fails to adequately investigate a case and is concerned only to prove what it believes 